first session this morning. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, struggling to get beyond the baseball metaphor, but I'm going to succumb and say uh, first up uh, will be uh, Carolyn Johns uh, from Ryerson University uh, talking about transboundary water effects, uh, efforts in the Great Lakes, the significance of national and subnational policy capacity, uh, followed by Bill Lowry from Washington University in St. Louis uh, talking about policy changes on Canadian rivers. And uh, then Mark Gadden from the Great Lakes Fisheries uh, Commission. And uh, Mark is, is also now an adjunct at uh, Michigan State University. Uh, talking about multi-jurisdictional governance of the Great Lakes Fisheries. Can a non-binding agreement uh, work? And then batting cleanup will be uh, the designated discussant, uh, Michael Kraft from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Um, following yesterday's uh, precedent uh, enforced by uh, Barry Rabe, we're going to stick pretty rigorously to the 15-minute uh, uh, <laughs> the, the time limit uh, so that we have plenty of time for Michael's comments and, and for uh, your engagement in, in the whole process. So, Carolyn. Good morning. Um, I'd first like to say that uh, I kind of came to this whole area of research Growing up on the Great Lakes in uh, Inco Town called Port Colborne, uh, where when in my youth uh, beaches were closed and that was kind of an awakening to some of these issues. I now live on Lake Ontario um, and thanks to Mark Sproul Jones, um, actually gained an interest in the whole uh, remedial action process in Hamilton and um, have kind of evolved to be interested in Canadian American comparisons of water policy more broadly. Um, and so that's how I come to this topic. Um, and I'm particularly interested in kind of looking at what's going on at the national and subnational levels in terms of implementation. And, um, and so that's the focus of my discussion. Um, I'm going to move this a little closer. Thanks. Um, and in light of Barry's opening comments, I'm going to try to put my paper in the context of the things that, um, that it tries to address in these five themes. First of all, I've always been interested in how water pollution policy is framed in Canada and the U.S and how it's framed differently. Um, in this paper, I look at uh, how in the transboundary context, uh, there's quite a bit of soft law. And, and then I delve into why in the US um, there is uh, considerably more hard law than there is in Canada. And um, I'm specifically interested in policy capacity, which came up yesterday in terms of our ability to implement um, some really important policy goals to make waters uh, fishable swimmable and drinkable, really broadly defined. Um, and the other issue that came up yesterday that's really related to my paper is the whole issue of asymmetry and what impact that actually has in the tra transboundary context. Um, and I do a little bit of focus on the need to shift to the focus of outcomes. Um, and my, actually, my paper, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there's all kinds of details about the outputs in the sense of legislative outputs, institutions, uh, bureaucracies and funding uh, that have, have grown up around the Great Lakes uh, Basin um, and in both in both jurisdictions. And then I end with some comments about the, um, the legacy of uh, the institutions and the kind of some foresight into what where we might be going in this and not, not based on my own uh, kind of primary research mainly on a, a basis of reviewing um, secondary research and continuing actually a, a comparative Canadian American water policy that uh, started with people like George Hoburg and uh, you know looked at the, at the differences between Canada and the US related to water policy more broadly. So these are the various sections of my paper. I'm actually going to focus on the uh, section um, two, three, and four mainly. Um, I think everybody in the room has a fairly decent understanding of the state of the Great Lakes in terms of water quality, so I don't need to delve into that, but there, is a sec there are sections in my paper about that. Um, and yesterday we saw this map about um, the areas of concern on the Great Lakes and the remedial action plan uh, process. And again, um, some of the issues that I'm really keenly interested in is, um, you know, for those of you that may actually have been around in 87 when the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was, was signed, um, in terms of policy implementation, how long uh, one expected this to take, uh, recognize that policy change does take a long time. Uh, but the question, I guess, at the heart of my paper is, uh, is 20 years um, just the beginning, or should we be a little further along here in terms of policy uh, outcomes and um, transboundary relations? 
And so um, this is no real news to you, but obviously there have been clearly some successes documented in terms of uh, water quality in the Great Lakes. Um, but in terms of kind of points of, of research interest, uh, one of my central questions is why, why some, some limits in terms of the progress? Um, as we heard yesterday, three areas of concern have been delisted, two areas in recovery after uh, 20 years of, of uh, specific focus on, on, on those areas. I'm also really interested in the transboundary implications of, of domestic policy uh, pollution events. Um, two that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in are the uh, Milwaukee um, pollution event in 1993 and our subsequent uh, pollution event in Ontario, the Walkerton Inquiry and uh, pollution event um, and actually the connection or lack thereof between those two pollution events. And so I've always been really interested in, in why um, in Ontario in particular, uh, we seem to be policy laggards in this area. And um, why in fact we didn't really lessen draw at all from the Milwaukee incident, which actually was on scale a, a way larger incident than, than what happened in Walkerton. Uh, estimates around 100 people uh, died uh, related to the cryptosporidium outbreak in, in Milwaukee and Walkerton was seven people, but in Ontario it, it clearly had an impact, and so that's one of the one of the things I'm looking at. The other uh, the other things that are, are talked about in the paper are just kind of indicators of progress. Uh, has progress slowed? There's a lot of discussion in the literature about whether we've actually um, slowed down in the last decade, and, and if so, why is that? And there's also um, you know emerging new issues like pharmaceuticals and invasive species, or the reemergence of some. Um, so clearly there's work to be done on the policy front um, related to implementation. Um, everyone is well familiar again with the um, transboundary policy response. There's people in the room like Mark Bill Jones that have done really uh, good work um, on this. Uh, another uh, in-depth look at actually a really a good book that compares Canada and the U.S. is a book by Botson Muldoon that looks at um, all kinds of different aspects of why the relationship um, has faltered in some cases, and why um, policy progress on both sides of the borders seems to have slowed. They argue that it, that it, it clearly slowed over the 1990s, uh, has regained a little bit of momentum, and um, they argue, and I guess I will kind of put myself in, the, in that camp, that uh, Canada's efforts have not been as um, um, enduring and um, as strong as uh, some of the efforts in the, uh, in the U.S. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, related to um, the kind of IJC in, in terms of its role, in terms of shifting the focus to subnationals, that's a theme that came out yesterday, and it's a really strong theme in my paper that I argue that you can't really get a good picture of implementation without looking at the role of, of national, subnational, local governments. Um, and, um, and that asymmetry between Canada and the U.S. is something that needs to be taken into consideration in any kind of future policy um, projects. We also heard a lot about the proliferation of transboundary institutions. I'm not going to go through all these. I'm just going to highlight that there clearly has been. And one of the interesting policy questions that we're tabling uh, in, in my paper and in others is what, what impact does this have not only on the IGC but on water policy in general and in my particular case on water pollution efforts. Um, and uh, just highlight that, that uh, Mark, you, Mark Spill Jones' paper has an appendix that lists all these kind of institutions outside of the Great Lakes. It's a good summary. I do them more in the text of my paper. And the other thing that um, I spend a little bit of time on in my paper is highlighting all the um, various user groups that have grown up around the Great Lakes and their, their, um, their role or lack thereof again in um, implementation. And particularly what Mark talked about yesterday is kind of clusters around various issues on the Great Lakes and how these various clusters relate or don't relate to each other. And in my case, I'm, I'm particularly interested in if the clusters are transboundary. Um, so my paper goes into basically a lot of uh, what kind of in, in public policy would be kind of considered uh, institutional policy history. I look at um, kind of um, legislative and program and a uh, series of initiatives at both levels of government um, in Canada and the U.S. And I'm not going to speak to all the different, I just put this list up here because I want to highlight that th there definitely are, um, th there is a more legislative approach in the U.S. Um, stemming right back to the, um, the, the uh, Clean Water Act and specific sections and legislative commitments in the U.S. legislation, and this is at the, at the federal level. 
Um, there's also many states that obviously have Great Lakes specific legislation, <coughs> and I, you'll so, I'll show you why that's important in contrast to Canada in a minute. Um, there's also been kind of an ongoing, um, even even in periods wh which would be considered low periods in Canada for water policy, uh, there were sustained, somewhat sustained efforts um, in the U.S. Again, comparatively here, um, and so this this is basically kind of a chronology of things of activities that have been going on. And one thing I'd note is that more recently that the subnational context is kind of uh, increasingly vibrant and involved in. Um, in um, you know fostering institutions, but also uh, pushing legislative responses. Um, in addition to the uh, General Accountability Office playing a role here, and you'll see that there's kind of a comparable role in Canada, although much weaker. The, gen uh, the Accountability Office in the U.S. seems to have prompted uh, some types of policy responses along the way as well. Um, so I, I actually outline a little bit uh, of detail about um, the various state and non-governmental factors that actually result in um, a more concerted effort on the U.S. side uh, than the Canadian side. And so some of these are uh, obviously action at the state level, um, specific legislation. Some of the bureaucratic institutions at the state level actually have Great Lakes offices um, and designated um, capacity around that. The other um, notable difference um, is the scientific and technical capacity, again, linked to <laughs> legislative reporting requirements in the U.S. that we don't have in Canada. Um, and the connections with universities are far stronger in many states than they are um, in, Can in, in Canada with universities around the Great Lakes agenda, although there have been highlights at certain points in Canada. Um, the other is um, the documented role of um, interest organizations and the capacity they bring to the policy process in the U.S and the comparative capacity of that in Canada. So overall, there's been a seemingly more of a sustained effort in the, um, in the US context to address water pollution. In Canada, we also have a series of legislation uh, around this, um, but we, we don't have any legislation that specifically commits uh, to the Great Lakes. Um, we have a, a, a series of um, indirect legislation um, and a series of intergovernmental agreements. And that's one thing that I'll come back to in a minute as being a significant difference between the two countries in terms of the intergovernmental approach. We also have a Commissioner of Environmental and Sustainable Development that has offered opinions about progress in the Great Lakes or lack thereof, but they've not generated the same type of response as those have uh, of the GAO in, um, in the U.S. Um, and the federal government role is a constant issue in Canadian environmental policy, not just in water, but um, you know, the question about what the federal role is beyond research um, is, um, is an ongoing debate, and, they, and it kind of, kind of pops up uh, every once in a while. Um, it, it's a, a continuing theme in the academic literature, but it pops up in government circles every once in a while around efforts around the most recent, the policy research initiative in, in 2006, before the Harper government actually came into power. Um, the effort was, uh, was a, a major one in Ottawa <coughs> to try to, to, try to um, say uh, in the same kind of context, uh, 20 years after uh, the federal water policy, do we need a new water policy? Um, post Walkerton, post other things. Um, so a lot of my um, analysis in the paper also looks at Ontario, because in contrast to having eight Great Lakes states, which is a coordination issue on the U.S. side, we have one. So you'd think we'd be able to, to do things a lot easier and a lot more efficiently. Um, but in fact, um, there, there's, um, there's lots of documented evidence as to why Ontario was up until very recently a policy laggard. Um, and I do, um, uh, outside of this paper, I do a lot of work on looking at uh, the impact of, of Walkerton as an inquiry. Um, and it has actually brought us up to speed, but mainly on the drinking water front. So all the legislative action that rolled out of that was focused on making water drinkable, not fishable and swimmable. Only very recently have there been connections between the Walkerton Inquiry, drinking water, and actually Great Lakes um, initiatives. So uh, this is kind of a, a, an interesting um, problem definition or framing issue, as, as was put by, by Barry. Um, other issues, clearly the asymmetry in resources, in scale, uh, uh, are, are notable. The other is intergovernmental issues. We don't have a, an EPA that's uh, equivalent in Environment Canada telling uh, the province you must do ABC to address point and non-point source pollution. Um, we have a series of intergovernmental agreements, mainly at what they are is agreements to fund initiatives together. And some of them have, have been, um, s you know, serious commitments of funds. Um, uh, 
but that funding has kind of waxed and waned over time and in the last 10 years this has not been um, substantial and so a lot of people say that that, that Canada actually has uh, retreated um, in the 1990s from its Great Lakes um, starting in the mid 1990s from its Great Lake effort as part of a broader uh, environmental policy retreat um, we also um, the, in terms of scientific capacity, yes, we have organizations like the National Water Research Institute uh, and, and others. Um, but again, the technical and scientific capacity, there's definitely an, a an asymmetry. Um, one interesting question that I've tried to, trying to unpackage is why we actually don't use more of the research that actually goes on south of the border um, uh, in terms of problem definition, but also just in, in terms of uh, transfer of, of knowledge and policy learning. Um, the other theme is uh, the role of um, environmental groups. Environmental groups are fragmented, less res well resourced. Many of them do have Great Lakes uh, water quality agendas, and again, they have to shift their resources depending on the, the day. Um, so there's been a lot of effort, again, around drinking water in the last uh, eight years or so for all environmental groups. And many of them still do have Great Lakes agendas, but um, only recently have pushed on the connections between some of those developments. Um, and broader water pollution in the in the basin. So in general, um, uh, the the um, the IGC does provide um, broad water quality goals and water pollution uh, problem definition, um, and I, I think has done a decent job of doing that. Um, but clearly, there are differences in terms of uh, that that are really highlighted in terms of implementation uh, on the implementation side. Um, and there are also differences in terms of broad policy goals for the two countries. Uh, again, mainly recognizing that um, Ontario's action has mainly been around drinking water, and the integration of point and non-point sources um, is something that it really we're late to the game in the sense that um, you know Section 319 has been in, in American legislation for quite some time, TMDLs, all these types of things, trying to integrate and move towards cross-medium types of approaches. We're a little behind on that. Um, this is comes up in not only my paper but another paper that our policy style is more decentralized and um, um, less legalistic. In other words, there's far less written down in law that we have to commit to, both in terms of funding programs and also in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, reporting. Reporting is the other major thing. Um, intergovernmentally, there's more vertical and horizontal capacity and integration in the U.S., even though that's still an issue that comes up all the time in the, in, in the water policy literature in the U.S. But com again, comparatively, there's, there's more of that. Um, and um, I think I've touched on most of the other things there. The last part of the paper really looks at, okay, what are the, some of the future policy options around this? And there's been lots of good um, works that's actually stemmed from the review of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, and some, some suggestions from the IGC itself in terms of uh, need to uh, redefine its role or shift its role. Um, in, in my opinion, I don't think we need more institutions. I think we need to figure out how to make them work better uh, collectively. Um, um, but there have, been lots of, there have been lots of suggestions for new institutions or combining institutions, making water boards do different things. Um, one of the papers is going to speak to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, whether, it, whether it's a model. I'm getting the I'm getting the hook here. Um, so renewing the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is a big question. Will that is that enough? Will it will it address some of these national and subnational differences? Will an accountability framework type approach work? Um, you know, will praising the lead leaders and pressuring the laggards work might might work in Canada more than the U.S. Um, and you know all these other kind of Great Lakes blueprints, a way forward. There's lots of uh, ideas kind of circulating around out there. Um, but they're, uh, they're related to broader water policy differences between the two countries. Um, and I think that that's really kind of one of the themes that I, I think we need to um, address and, um, and kind of moving this forward in terms of more complex ways of thinking about not only water pollution policy, but linking the quality and quantity regimes is a really big issue. Uh, I think both sides of the border, uh, particularly in Canada, they're quite distinct. Um, and then cross-medium challenges, and I think uh, we're going to have papers later on climate policy and, um, you know, uh, land, air, water um, are connected in ecosystems but uh, not reflected in political and uh, institutional arrangements. Okay, thanks. Carol, thank you. Well, uh, 
Bill Lowry, uh, and I can't resist, the, the author of Damn Politics. Um, <laughs> a, a fabulous title. I think every academic aspires to, uh, <laughs> to, to write a book with such a title. Um, we'll be talking about policy changes on Canadian rivers. Thanks for the plug, Steve. Uh, <coughs> good morning. I figure that um, just to continue the baseball analogy, since I'm batting second now that Carolyn's on base, you know that, that there's very little pressure on the number two hitter because all he has to do is kind of move things along, and, <laughs> and these guys have to hit him <laughs> out of the park. So. Um, I wanted to start with a, um, again, good morning to everybody. It's nice to see you all here. I, I wanted to start with a picture, and uh, some of you might recognize this. This is the Big East River in northern Ontario. Um, in part, I just want to preview that I am going to get to some empirical discussion and a couple of case studies, one of them being the Big East. Um, and I want you to notice one thing in that picture, and that is that it is a river. There's no dam there, there's no lake, it's a river. And that's part of the story that I want to get to later on. But before I do that, um, I want to make one caveat, and that is that the, the title on this is, it's not nearly as catchy as Dam Politics, but the title is also a little bit uh, overreaching. I, I'm not discussing all Canadian rivers by any means. I'm talking about a couple of rivers with the idea being that I want to try and look at policy change in Canada and use those rivers as a case study. I would also offer one other caveat, that, and that is that I, I, I don't spend a lot of time on the IJC, and um, you'll see why in the cases, so the IJC reps should be warned about that. And I'll, talk, I'll tell you why I still think this is a transboundary issue here um, very shortly. Before I get into the cases, though, I want to do I want to talk, uh, provide a little bit of a theoretical foundation for my arguments, and then I want to give a little background on the U.S. case because that's important for discussing what, what's happened in Canada. Um, the questions I'm asking in this uh, paper are really pretty basic, and that is, do policy changes occur differently in Canada than in, than in the United States? And if they are, assuming that there, is, there are differences, are those differences so great that one can think of those changes as being isolated from the American experience? The short answer to the second question is no, and that's the tra transboundary part of this, and it, it's in terms of the role of, of ideas. Um, before I get to that, uh, let me just do a little bit of theoretical background on policy change in general, as a lot of people in this room know that there, there have been some comparative analyses of policy change in Canada and the U.S., um, not nearly as many as you might think, given how many similarities there are between the two countries, and the ones that have been done, a lot of them have been done by people in this room. and. Um, so I'll, I'll do this fairly quickly. Now, just in terms of policy changes and innovations to policies, some of the thing, some of the work that has been done has anticipated very little difference, very little variation between the U.S. and Canada in terms of how policy does change, um, and in fact often offer more predictions of convergence rather than divergence, just in terms of innovations. And, and I want to suggest that I think that we can actually expect significant differences between Canada and the U.S. in terms of how policy changes. And um, I, what I want to do is give you uh, four basic reasons for why I expect that there would be those differences between the two countries. And they're based on the large questions that somebody would ask when they were looking at how policy changes over time. Um, first question you probably ask is who's pushing it? Who are the primary change agents? Who are the people that are really pushing some kind of change, some kind of innovation? And in a lot of American uh, studies, um, and I cite a couple there, um, often the focus is on national interest groups, public agents, federal agencies, uh, the media, and often more recently in the form of advocacy coalitions that put all those different groups together. Um, there are a lot of differences that we, between the U.S. and Canada that would make us think that that might not be the way we want to think about policy change in Canada. And Carolyn just mentioned a couple of them already, and that is that um, for one thing, Canada takes federalism a lot more seriously than the United States does. <laughs> and so policy responsibilities are much more decentralized in Canada, and thus there's a greater role for provincial governments than there might be for state governments in some of these issues. Uh, second thing that Carolyn just mentioned is that federal agencies, like the Canadian equivalent to the federal, the U.S. EPA, they're generally not nearly as strong and not nearly as institutionalized as they have become in the United States. Um, third one that also Carolyn mentioned, so we're being very consistent here, uh, interest groups in Canada are much more localized, generally. I'm, I know I'm overstating some of these, but they're more localized for the most part. Um, you don't see nearly as much, a, nearly as prominent a role for national interest groups in Canadian policymaking as you do in the U.S. Thus, uh, one hypothesis that I'll offer is that um, we would expect to see a crucial role for 
of subnational bureaucrats, particularly um, professionals at the provincial level. And you might notice I've put some names of people that, have s that I cite in the paper here, and I, I, I'm very remiss in not including names of a lot of people in the room on some of these, and uh, the only reason is I can only cram so much in one of these slides, so <laughs> sorry if I'm missing people. But, uh, so, that, so that's one possible hypothesis. Uh, a second question you'd ask about policy change is, well, just how substantial is the change? What's the likelihood of a significant alteration of existing status quo policy? And traditionally in the U.S., most people thought of policy change in terms of incrementalism and that cha change only occurred at the margins. That, that no longer holds. And a lot of people now, a lot of scholars now say that, in fact, we've seen in longitudinal, longitudinal studies of different public policies, we've seen s substantial changes. Um, I would argue that that's, that those, that degree of change is less likely in Canada. And again, it has to do with the reasons that I was just discussing in the previous slide, and that is that there are, um, because there are not, there are not nearly so much in the way of national institutions and a strong role for national interest groups, then um, these decisions are going to be left down to provincial governments who may be reluctant to shake up the status quo. And we've seen this in environmental policy, and I think that's been mentioned in a couple of papers here at this conference already. Um, so the hypothesis is that in order to get substantial change in policy, we need a fortuitous convergence or an alignment of different factors that might enable some entrepreneur to push policy change. Third question you'd want to ask about policy changes is how widely are they emulated and dispersed. Um, and again, there's a fairly large literature on this about, particularly in the U.S., about how change spreads across state borders. Um, my argument is that that's going to be, that that diffusion of ch innovations is going to be much more dispersed in Canada, again, because there are not, there are wide differences between the provinces. There are not the uh, strong institutional actors that can foster that dissemination of different innovations. So we'll see a slower diffusion of innovations. And then finally, a, a, a fourth question that you'd want to ask about policy change is that, I is it so different in Canada that it's going to be removed from the United States? And here is where I think that um, my paper is still somewhat transboundary because there's been a growing literature in the political science field about the role of ideas and how they cross borders and how they can impact what <coughs> policy actors do. Um, Canada is not at all isolated from the U.S. in terms of the exchange of ideas. As we all know, there are very few language barriers. There's a lot of traffic across the border. There are groups, there are uh, uh, institutions like the IJC that can facilitate communication um, between the two countries, and there are also scholarly exchanges like the one we're having here over the last couple of days where people can exchange ideas. So there is going to be some cross-national fertilization and some transboundary um, uh, exchange of ideas that might impact policy change. So just to summarize the policy change, the hypotheses for policy change that I see, um, crucial role for provincial bureaucrats, uh, a need for fortuitous alignments of different factors. Uh, innovations will be widely dispersed, and um, these changes are not developed in isolation, but rather influenced by the flow of ideas. Now, in order to make this argument, I need to give a little background on the U.S. And uh, just very briefly, um, this is a photo of uh, Great Falls, Montana. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's not really a falls anymore. It's not really great anymore when Meriwether Lewis <laughs> When Meriwether Lewis went through there with Lewis and Clark, Lewis called it the most sublime uh, spectacle he had ever seen. And it's not that anymore. It's been changed dramatically. And that's the short story in terms of American uh, river management, uh, river, uh, management of American rivers. That rivers have been managed over the last two centuries to provide for economic utility. And they have been largely structured and managed uh, with dams, dikes, levees, other modifications. Um, I often give this uh, question about, or uh, to different audiences when I talk about American rivers. I bet a lot of people in this room know the answer to it, so there won't be nearly as much of a dramatic impact. But uh, dams six feet high or higher, do you know how many there are in the United States? How many know? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Just wing a figure. Six feet high or higher in the United States, 75,000 dams. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a pretty dramatic figure, and that gives you some sense of how much rivers have been changed in the United States. And for, for centuries, those changes were supported by sub-governments. They were very rarely questioned. Now, in the last 20 years or so, there have been a lot of questions. 
and a lot of criticisms of the way we, we've managed rivers. And I, I just want to cite two, because I don't want to run out of time, I just want to cite two major policy changes to the way Americans manage rivers that might impact Canadian changes on their rivers. One is an effort to try and maintain min minimum in-stream flows. And this came up yesterday in Tim's discussion, I believe, about water allocation, that if you don't have enough water in the river, then it can have a severe impact on the ecosystem. Um, and so the idea is to try and maintain flow levels to support an ecosystem. And this has been used on rivers from as small as the Osage, where this picture comes from in Missouri, where I'm from, to the Colorado. Um, and I'm actually kind of proud of this slide because I got that little f that photo, the sign in there as well that says change in water levels. Anyway, that's the idea that you change water levels to maintain in-stream flows. Second major policy change, and this one's even more dramatic, is dam removal. And uh, just again in the last 10, 15 years in the United States, there's, there have been many more conscious efforts at trying to remove dams and structures from rivers. This picture happens to be from the Kennebec River in Maine where the Edwards Dam was removed in 1999, and some of you might be familiar with that case. It was an incredibly important case, seminal case, in that the policymakers actually took out a dam that had existed for nearly 200 years and had impacted the ecosystem to the extent that uh, uh, species had, the sp level of species was down 90 percent from historical levels. They took the dam out over the objections of the owner, the fish are coming back. Since that time, 1999, there have been about 300 dams removed in the United States. So it's a pretty significant development, and it comes up again later in the discussion about Canada. So those are the two big ideas, minimum midstream flows and dam removal. Um, so now to talk about river management in Canada, and um, I'll cite this very briefly because, again, I don't want to run out of time. Um, this is a photo of the Old Man Dam in Alberta. Tim recognizes it. Uh, in fact, I know he's been there, as I have, and uh, you can see this sign there, preserving and enhancing the environment. They put that up because it was a very controversial dam, some of you probably know. In fact, I think some of you know this a lot better than I do. Um, but in some ways, it signifies traditional management of rivers in Canada because they still built the dam in spite of the objection, in spite of the controversy. And uh, um, this was 1987. Now. Um, Again, just to summarize, traditional management of rivers in Canada, an abundance of powerful rivers, thus very tempting for use, particularly for irrigation and hydropower. Again, as you know, hydropower provides about two-thirds of Canadian, Canada's electricity. There are now, I used the 75,000 figure for the U.S., there are about 40, 48,000 dams in Canada, um, 793 of them designated as large. Large means at least 15 meters high or higher. So that gives you some sense of how many dams there are, and I mentioned the Old Man Dam. <clears throat> now, I think Old Man Dam was important. I think it raised awareness about river management and the way we use and structure rivers. And um, as a result, I'm going to talk about two cases that have come up very diffused, very different provinces, and very different stories. And the first one is in British Columbia. Um, and British Columbia, again, I think all of you know that have spent time there, very intensive use of rivers, particularly for hydropower. Again, uh, over 90 percent of their electricity comes from hydropower. Um, the primary user is BC Hydro. BC Hydro is a very powerful crown corporation, um, has a lot of plants. You can see the figures on different rivers in British Columbia. And they, their decisions have rarely been questioned in the past, if for no other reason they contribute a lot of money to the BC government. And it's a pretty, been a pretty cozy relationship over time. All of this changed in recent years, particularly in the 1990s. And um, I tell a story in the paper about these guys that I, uh, that I met and talked with extensively when I was up in BC last year um, that kind of blew the story open on water allocations in British Columbia. And the story in brief is that it's a small coalition of people that are pushing for change on BC rivers. And what happened was, one of these guys was working for the Ministry of Environment, and he was assigned to do participate in this review of BC rivers to discuss how you could tweak the dams that existed in order to get more power without causing more severe environmental damage. And while he was doing this review, he uncovered some figures. He uncovered some data that showed that BC Hydro was taking more water out of the rivers than they were entitled to according to their allocations. And he broke the story open. I mean, he had some help. Um, particularly from some advocates that were pretty savvy with the media. 
Um, there were also some interest groups that were pushing for changes on individual rivers that were very interested in this story. And so they were kind of, it was kind of an inside-outside thing that people working from the insider government, whistleblowers, people working from the outside that were, um, uh, that were interested in changing specific rivers. And the idea they borrowed, this is the transboundary part, and when these guys told me the idea they borrowed was this methodology that had been developed at Colorado State University called in-stream flow incremental methodology to determine depth, velocity, and habitat needs for waterways and how much water a particular river would need. And the, 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 I'm running out of time, so the short story is that they, as a result, they have now instituted the idea of water use plans on all rivers in British Columbia to maintain specific flows. And the pilot project, <coughs> that's a picture here, and there are the two guys that really broke this story open. Um, this guy, they won't mind me giving their names. It's in the paper because the guy, no, the one guy no longer works for the government, to be quite honest, but the whistleblower. Um, but this is the Alouette River, and the Alouette River was pretty much dead because the hydropower companies were taking more water out than they should have. At sometimes during the year, it was down to two CFS, two cubic feet per second. Now they have a water use plan on this river that uh, maintains a minimum average of 90 CF, CFS per year. And the really neat part of this story is when I was up there, um, I got a message from these guys shortly after that that the fish were coming back. First time in 80 years that adult sockeye were swimming back up the river because they had maintained minimum flows. So that's one change. Um, the second case study I look at in the paper, and I know I'm doing these way too fast, but uh, it's on Ontario rivers. And I'm, I mentioned that slide at the start that showed the Big East River. Um, there are still about 2,000 dams in the province of Ontario. Uh, most of them, I say less intensive because most of them are smaller than the ones in BC. Um, hundreds of those dams were built for hydro and logging operations. Uh, and <coughs> people got used to these dams and so they don't like to see them removed. And there had never been a discussion of removal of any of these dams for environmental reasons until 19, the 1990s. And in 1999, a guy I'm gonna show you in just a second, I was asking him, well, how come you guys removed this specific dam on the Big East River? It's the Finlayson Dam. Um, and I'll show you a photo in a second. I said, why did you guys do this? And he said, we saw a tape of the Edwards removal. It's a classic example of a transboundary, a, a transfer of an idea from one place to another going across the border. They saw a tape of the Edwards Dam removal from Maine. They decided they had this environmental assessment process in place whereby they could think about doing this. They put together this coalition, again, of provincial bureaucrats. Um, and they removed the Finlayson Dam on the Big East River. It was, a, it was an ideal candidate for a lot of reasons. I can get into question and answer if you want me to. But again, this is the spot on the Big East River where the Finlayson Dam used to sit. It's no longer there. The river is restored. The fish are coming back. <coughs> and uh, it's, again, like I said in previously, it's now a river. It's no longer a lake and a meadow. Now, having said that, I don't know. Maybe somebody can correct me in here. I don't know of another dam that they have removed in Ontario since then. I asked this guy, Nick Peroski, this engineer, I said, you guys own about 300 dams in this province. How many would you like to see removed? He said, all of them, <laughs> which I thought was real interesting. But they haven't been able to do it because people get used to their dams. This is the Thornberry Dam in Ontario. They went through the whole process, the whole environmental assessment process to try to remove the Thornberry 2002. Uh, they got 54% 54, 54 of their respondents saying, let's get rid of this dam. They still didn't do it. Why? Because there were the people that wanted to keep the dam had power and influence with the provincial government. So it's still there. <clears throat> and so it's very hard to make these changes. And again, changes, I think, are pretty diffuse. They're not, and I don't, again, I don't know of other dam removals in Canada that have followed since they did this in Ontario. Um, I know I'm out of time, so let me just summarize with some conclusions. Uh, uh, policy changes, I think, de depend on small groups, uh, partic particularly pr provincial bureaucrats. Um, Changes can be quite dramatic, but they only occur, as one guy told me, when the stars line up. Um, diffusion of these innovations are generally slower in Canada than in the U.S. And even having said that, changes are not isolated from the U.S., but in fact they are affected by ideas that come from the United States. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Um, Mark Gadden is going to talk about multi-jurisdictional governance of the Great Lakes fishery. Can a non-binding agreement work? And it, it occurs to me, I was just looking at the, uh, the, the roster, that, that Mark is, uh, is the one person who really sits on both sides. He's both uh, an academic, but he's also a, a practitioner at the Great Lakes Fishery uh, Commission. So Mark, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you very much, and I'm pleased to be here. Um, 
The, uh, the purpose of this paper is to, um, first of all, describe uh, the fishery management regime in the Great Lakes Basin because it is quite unique uh, and it, uh, it, it's a result really of, of, a, of a very complex um, division of, of um, political boundaries. But I also um, will talk for the second half of it really reflect upon why the people who are involved in Great Lakes fishery management prefer a non-binding agreement um, as opposed to something that's a little bit more binding to help them achieve their shared objectives. So the outline of this presentation is first to talk about uh, the Great Lakes fishery and who manages it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about agreements and sovereignty and how that relates. Um, talk about the regime then that the fishery managers have established to help them work across the political boundaries. And then I'll uh, draw some conclusions um, about why they, the people who actually manage the fishery, prefer a non-binding agreement to a binding approach. So the Great Lakes fishery and who manages it. One of the things that is particularly striking about the Great Lakes, um, and it's been brought up in previous presentations, is that the political boundaries are quite numerous. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about the non-federal or subnational governments and how they cooperate. So you have eight Great Lakes states and the province of Ontario uh, managing the Great Lakes fishery. For most of the history of, uh, of the Great Lakes Basin since the times of European settlement up until about the 1940s, they attempted, the states and from time to time the province, attempted to work together on fishery management, on harmonizing their fishery laws, on trying to come to some uh, uh, general uh, way of working together over the shared fishery. And time and again they failed largely because none of the two, neither, none of the jurisdictions could come to some agreement on harmonizing their, their laws or practices. But that said, um, it is complex. You have uh, Michigan, uh, there's the big uh, dog in the room there, uh, with, it's very active on the Great Lakes and it makes little sense for um, uh, Michigan not to talk to Wisconsin, but there you go. For most of the history, they uh, didn't talk to each other and the other jurisdictions didn't either. You also have, um, since, um, particularly since the emergence of, of, uh, of, of court cases in the late 1970s, the emergence of the U.S. tribes uh, in Great Lakes Fishery Management, and they have banded together in two organizations, one called the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and the other the Chippewa and Ottawa Resource Authority. Uh, they have uh, signed agreements with the federal government of the United States uh, treaties back in the 1800s, and never gave up their rights to fish in the waters. Um, there's a treaty, the purple area there of 1842, and the light blue area, 1836. And these are waters that tribes have uh, some management authority over the fisheries. On the Canadian side, the First Nations have um, similar treaties, but the courts have generally ruled that uh, the provincial and federal governments can, quote, manage on their behalf. And so the, the rights of the First Nations to have some management on the lakes is, is much different than on the U.S. side of the border. So this is the, these are the subnational governments, the eight states, the province of Ontario, and the two U.S. intertribal organizations that have a primary role uh, to manage the fishery. It's their primary responsibility. It's, it's not a federal responsibility, it's a state responsibility and provincial and tribal. But you do have federal agencies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Fisheries and Oceans Canada, that have some role in the Great Lakes fishery, largely the rehabilitation of native species. And then you have a binational agreement, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, the institution uh, for which I work, uh, that's established under a treaty uh, with very, very specific uh, responsibilities that relate to research, recommendations to government, uh, most notably sea lamprey control, which is an on-the-ground program that the Fishery Commission is responsible for. And um, the Fishery Commission also has a tiny little provision in the treaty that says that we shall establish working relationships among the governments, and that's uh, how we fit in to this larger process of fishery management um, among the subnational governments. And I'll explain that in a minute. Shared interests, whether you're a province or a state or a tribe or a fed or the fishery commission, uh, there are some shared interests that everybody has in common. Sustain the fish stocks, protect diversity, manage the predator and prey, balance in the lakes, uh, balance constituent needs, manage based on science. But the primary management, as I've said, rests with the subnational governments. The states and the province and the, and the tribes license their fishers. They tell you how many uh, fish you can take out and when. Uh, the size of those fish. They stock uh, primarily for recreational purposes. Um, there's a lot of stocking that occurs also for rehabilitation purposes of native species. Uh, they do assessment work, uh, habitat protection, law enforcement, and they're the face forward to the public. So on the ground, the name of the game is at the subnational level. 
And when you again look back at that map and realize that you have eight states, the province of Ontario, and the two intertribal governments working, uh, needing to work together, you can see that without some mechanism to do so, uh, there's going to be chaos, conflicting policies, working at cross purposes, wasted resources, and um, generally back to uh, where we were up until about the 1940s of, um, of a well-documented decline and ruin of the fishery because of a lack of interest in working together. So moving on then, um, I was looking um, very interested in, in agreements and how these entities can work together and how sovereignty fits into it. And it gets back to the introduction that, um, that Barry Rabe and Stephen Brooks uh, brought up uh, as one of the themes of this conference, and that is um, sort of hard and soft law and agreements. Um, there are uh, uh, hard or binding type agreements, which um, in general have a higher stature uh, and are enforceable. These are uh, treaties, conventions, um, interstate compacts are examples of these types of agreements. The issue with a hard agreement is it um, does relinquish some sovereignty, the entities that sign it. But it, um, but it does reduce the transaction costs, and what I mean by that is that um, ongoing bargaining is limited because it's written in the agreement. It's just, this is what we're going to do, and, and um, less open to interpretation or needs, uh, need for ongoing bargaining to occur. Um, and it reduces the ability to build relationships um, that I'm going to talk about in a second that are so important to the non-binding agreements. Um, the literature is very clear that with a binding agreement you get high compliance because you generally get high compliance because entities are not going to sign an agreement to which they're bound um, if they don't agree with, uh, with what the provisions of that agreement are. But uh, with that high compliance you end up with an agreement often that is the lowest common denominator or the, the least uh, type of, at least to which all the entities can agree to. This is compared to a non-binding or um, more soft type agreements. Uh, not enforceable the same way a binding agreement would be. Um, such an agreement relinquishes little or no sovereignty to the entities that sign it, but there are higher transaction costs. You have ongoing uh, need to uh, reach consensus, uh, to, to bargain with other parties, to um, focus on dialogue and building relationships because uh, the agreement itself is, um, uh, is, is soft. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's reliant on these types of uh, relationship building activities. Compliance depends on the goodwill of the parties for the enforcement of it because um, obviously if there's nothing that binds you, um, you're only going to be so bound as you feel you are to, um, to the agreement and the provisions of it. But one of the benefits of this in contrast to say a hard agreement is that it's more flexible, could be more flexible or ambitious. In the Great Lakes region then I'd like to focus, shift the focus on how then the fishery managers cooperate um, and then I'll talk later about why they prefer a non-binding agreement. And I'm going to walk you through the process. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit, a lot to throw at you really because it's um, a little bit complex, but I have a slide that builds that should describe the Joint Strategic Plan and how it works. But keep in mind as I talk about this that the Joint Strategic Plan for management of Great Lakes fisheries, which is the non-binding agreement that the non-federal governments um, have agreed to, is a uh, non-binding, non-regulatory, consensus-based agreement. And here's how it works. As I said, the primary fishery managers are the province of Ontario, the um, eight states, and U.S. tribal groups. Uh, their means of, for cooperation are, what call, are what's called the lake committees and technical committees, which they've established through the Joint Strategic Plan for Management of Great Lakes Fisheries. These lake committees, the lake committees are made up of senior fishery managers from each of the um, eight states, the province, and the tribes. Uh, they tend to be the lake manager for that lake, so they're um, relatively senior in the Department of Natural Resources or the ministry or their tribal authority. And um, these are the same people that have to um, implement fishery policies within their jurisdiction. What I mean by that is they can sit together as a lake committee, and uh, each lake has a committee. So Lake Huron, for example, is made up of Michigan, Ontario, and the tribal groups on the lake. They sit as a lake committee, and, and when they um, agree to something uh, together, they then have to take it back to their own jurisdiction and implement it. So they make that pro promise that when they develop something together, they have to they, they take it back to their own uh, jurisdiction and implement it. Technical committees are similar. They're made up, however, of biologists and in the field folks who provide information, science information, for example, to the lake committees um, to help the lake committees make their decisions. <coughs> This is uh, what was uh, mentioned earlier in the introduction is the epistemic community. It's a community of professionals that uh, relate to each other. They understand each other. They understand the language. Um, and uh, they work very closely together um, 
folks in New York, for example, work more closely with the people in Ontario than they do uh, with folks, say, downstate in Manhattan. It's that type of community. They work for Lake Ontario as opposed to um, their own jurisdiction. Often they have that feeling. So that's what the lake committees are. They're um, meetings of fishery managers and biologists that come together um, with, from time to time, input from other plan, joint strategic plan participants like the federal agencies, uh, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which uh, facilitates this process. We play the role of, of making sure that the, um, that the lake committees meet and also sort of non-fishery agencies, so environmental agencies. The out and, and uh, direct stakeholder input is largely still the responsibility of the individual jurisdictions. The outcome of this process are shared policies. Um, the types of policies that they come up with are shared objectives, fish community objectives, plans for um, how they're going to rehabilitate species. Um, they're not the types of, of, of outcomes like we're going to all um, have a bag limit of X. That's something that they leave up to the states. They say the objective is to have the fishery look like this. The states and the province and the tribes then would take that back and um, um, promulgate regulations um, that would hopefully meet those objectives. And if they don't, they, they um, hammer on each other at this late committee process. Why didn't you um, adhere to it? You're the one that agreed to it. It's also important to remember, however, that each of these jurisdictions retains their um, authority and sovereignty um, and that this plan doesn't uh, diminish that. So the uh, shared objectives that's done, um, I think there's a laser pointer here maybe. The shared objectives that are, here it is, that are done in, uh, in this portion of it uh, influence what the individual agencies do. But on the other hand, what the individual agencies do also has an influence on the shared policies because they're the same people that are, that are not only developing those policies, but also implementing them within their own agencies. This is just a process to try and, and have these folks who are doing it anyway uh, come together and come to some uh, shared uh, set of objectives. And the, um, oops, a little bit of that got cut off there. The, object, the procedures really for management of a plan is mutual accountability. Um, this is building very strangely. But mutual accountability to each other. They produce minutes and they can go back and see, you know, who's adhering to that. They share information and they base their decisions on consensus. So that's sort of a short overview of how uh, they work together under this joint strategic plan. And I'm just going to conclude with um, some of their thoughts about why a non-binding agreement, why they've chosen this type of approach as opposed to something more um, binding. Uh, and the data sources that I used for this research uh, were um, I interviewed 62 uh, individuals who are part of the Lake Committee process, so all of the Lake Committee members, several technical committee members, and people who are active in the process. I observed the process for many years and um, analyzed historical documents like minutes and other reports. And what I, what I found out is that there are several reasons why these participants, again, it's their plan, uh, prefer a non-binding approach. And one is that sovereignty and independence are extremely important to these entities. And, and a very common response was like one of my participants who said, what really can another jurisdiction say to you about what you can and cannot do? These members are very aware of the fact that Michigan is going to do what it needs to do to manage its fishery, and, and Ontario is going to do what it wants to do. The best they can hope to do is to find a way to work together to make sure that those policies are um, harmonized or at least they're in agreement on where they're going to go on, on that or how they can share resources even. Second reason why uh, they prefer a non-binding agreement is that they do view uh, fishery management in the Great Lakes as needing flexibility. An agreement that might say um, harvest of X, Y, and Z today might sound like a good idea, but tomorrow when conditions change, it becomes ridiculous um, and, and not consistent with how the management should occur. They didn't want an agreement that did that anyway. They wanted one that would help them identify their um, shared goals and objectives and to help find ways to reach that. One participant said, once a firm and specific agreement is signed, sealed, and delivered, there's no wiggle room. Battles would even be more intense than they are now. Um, so they focus on the types of things that where they can be <coughs> proactive and, and, um, and, um, and flexible, and this agreement doesn't cover other things that are left up to the states like regulation. And finally, uh, one of the things that um, really emerged in this research and in the interviews was the fact that um, they see a non-binding agreement as still able to ensure some bit of compliance. Um, it's us versus us. In other words, the same people that are developing the shared objectives are the ones that are going to have to influence uh, to implement them. So um, really, if you uh, decide on something and then not take it back and implement it, you're, you're countering your own opinion on the matter. 
uh, they feel a sense of ownership in the plan. They have that epistemic community. Uh, there's peer pressure. We take others into account before we take actions that could affect the whole system. And um, one area as well that I didn't talk as much about is the role of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in this as playing um, the role of a neutral third party. The Fishery Commission doesn't have regulatory authority over the fishery um, <coughs> the same way that the states and the province and the tribes do. But nevertheless, the Fishery Commission makes sure that they meet as they agree to and um, you know, the Fishery Commission publishes their objectives and keeps everybody moving on track. So just some general conclusions and um, I'm just winding up uh, on the time here. Um, some realities to keep in mind. Responsibility, uh, there is a responsibility to manage a shared resource on the lakes. Uh, the authority is diffuse. Uh, the non-federal governments, the subnational governments have considerable autonomy over what is a shared resource. Um, and there is a strong interest in maintaining independence and a mutual interest in strategic planning and identifying shared goals. Why they prefer a non-binding agreement is because uh, sovereignty of the states uh, needs to be respected. They desire flexibility um, more than a um, sort of a rigid agreement that will ensure compliance. There are design elements of the joint strategic plan that help ensure that it's implemented, uh, which is things like respect for the jurisdictional independence and reliance on shared strategies. And they do, the, the, the people who make this process work themselves believe that implementation can occur because it's a consensus-based agreement. The policies that they develop through this process are their own um, they feel accountable and professionally accountable to, to their peers on the process, and there's a neutral third party to help facilitate. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we'll turn things over directly to Michael Kraft. Okay, well, three very different papers, and uh, let me again try to stay within enough of a time limit that's set so we have some time for uh, audience involvement. I'll start with Carolyn's uh, paper that's proceeding in order. Uh, what I found especially attractive about this paper is the, uh, the discussion of policy capacity and the need to produce policy solutions that draw from multiple approaches. It's something I touched on very briefly yesterday. I, and I think we really, is that good? Oh, really, we start with, with the uh, statement that after all these years of the remedial action plans and so on, and I did touch on this yesterday, that actually remarkably little progress has been made. And I think for all of these papers, we need to ask, and Bell noted it with his, uh, ultimately the test is, are the rivers being restored? <laughs> ultimately the test is, are the fisheries restored? And is water quality what we want it to be? So although we're focusing on institutions and innovative uh, you know, policy actions, uh, we come back again to, the, the real test of whether any of this works and makes sense to, to recommend and duplicate elsewhere is, is, is whether you can find the uh, uh, policy outcomes that testify to their success. Uh, I very much liked the, as I say, the notion of looking at policy capacity um, and understanding what it takes to achieve uh, environmental uh, policy success in the area. I was particularly attracted to uh, Carolyn's uh, discussion and the history of the areas of concern. I did think the paper, I mean, this is kind of a suggestion when it moves along to, to uh, book chapters. There's quite a bit in the paper that's a history and details, not so much in what we discussed this morning, but <clears throat> I guess I would say more precisely, what I'd like to see is a little bit more about what went right and what went wrong. That is the difference difference between success and failure. Um, given the <coughs> uh, given the difficulty of uh, really making this a success, I think inquiring more into um, <coughs> Inquire more into um, why we had the results that we have. In particular, I guess, um, what would it take in the future to have more success, particularly uh, the use of scientific information, um, 
Oh, let's see what folks are. Just one, one other, and it's a little bit disconnected, let me get back in focus here. One other line of analysis that I guess I'd like to see more of. There's some discussion of the difference between the, the U.S. and Canada and some discussion of the pulling back in recent years. And what I didn't see nearly as much of, it's kind of implied and it's, indirect, and that is what difference it makes for the, the party in power, the role of ideology. Uh, I know far more about the U.S. situation. I think it's easy to look back on the last eight years, let's say, in particular, and see the consequence of the Bush administration actions, and I think there's a tendency, as we look at these broader questions of institutional design and performance, to think in think in terms of institutional structures, to think in terms of some abstract ideas and to lose track of the, the really strong role that's played by policy preferences on the part of policymakers, the role of political party, the role of ideology, and the lack of willingness perhaps to follow through on some of the earlier commitments. I struck also, uh, we had uh, John Austin of the University of Michigan was at our campus recently. Some of you may know of his work for the Brookings Institution. It uh, has to do with um, ecological restoration in the entire Great Lakes area. And the case that he makes is that it will take a, an enormous amount of money to restore the Great Lakes. But doing so adds enormously to economic development, so it becomes a good investment to do so. Uh, and this is the kind of argument that might appeal far more to those with a more conservative philosophy who may wonder about environment, you know, spending money on environmental programs, but if you turn it around and say, uh, and, and maybe here's where a combination of scientific information, economic information can make a difference to the parties that the, and I'm thinking, as I noted yesterday about the, the Green Bay wrap, which I think is, it may be as typical, uh, you have a lot of, a lot of stakeholder involvement, a lot of meetings between industry and government and federal government, state and local governments, environmental groups, uh, all of which doesn't ultimately produce what you hope it will and eventually people get tired, uh, arguments are repeated, action doesn't happen and if we come back again to the, the ultimate test, uh, are the areas being restored and you provide some very interesting figures that the answer is pretty much no. Uh, that forces you to go back to reconsider the design, and maybe this relates to some of the other papers in terms of not with the non-binding agreements and, and collaborative processes uh, work. And, and so to some extent, and this kind of lead into Bill's paper about the role of policy ideas, I think as people adopt new approaches and say, well, maybe we turn this around and think of it as economic development and building of tourism and rebuilding of fisheries, which has economic value. And, and in turn, that relates to the environmental policy goals that otherwise by themselves don't seem to sell very well in some, in some communities. Much of the paper, we used this language yesterday, much of Carolyn's paper does deal with uh, efforts over the years to develop various agreements and so these of course are policy outputs and ultimately you need to ask whether those are producing uh, the results uh, in terms of policy outcomes and, and that's hard to measure. So a very good uh, history of efforts to restore water quality in the Great Lakes and particularly for those interested in the designation of the areas of concern and the remedial action plans. Um, I think again what any paper like this needs is even though there have been relatively few successes to find out why the successes are what they are, why some programs some efforts have worked and others have, have not. Uh, and we know all too little about that. I think we can all think of the factors or variables that would make a difference, but it's not maybe as clear uh, as it could be. Uh, for Bell's paper, I found this, again, a fascinating study of policy change dealing with, with uh, river restoration and particular dam removal, but not only that. And as he says, there's actually a pretty good literature in political science and maybe in some related fields that I know less about uh, work by Paul Sabatier and advocacy coalitions, Baumgartner and Jones on agenda setting, John Kingdon's and uh, a policy entrepreneurs. Bill uses the, the language of uh, change advocates, uh, which I uh, 
like the Kingdom talks about policy entrepreneurs, and, and I, I see this also in the other papers, but particularly in, in bills, and it's a reminder that as much as we focus on grand institutions and seek to define binding and non-binding agreements and catalog all of this, when it comes down to how change actually occurs, it seems to come from a relatively small number of people in strategic locations. <laughs> it's political leaders at just the right time, it's a supportive uh, public, Bill used this phrase which I had put in my notes and quotes, and fortuitous alignment of relevant factors, I like that. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure how you always get it. It just, you know, looking back, you can identify there was an, uh, what, what was your, your respondent said, just the stars aligned. <laughs> stars aligned. <laughs> stars aligned, but I guess analytically, wouldn't it be terrific if we could figure out in advance what it takes to make the stars align <laughs> rather than to observe after the fact that they did align? Uh, because then we're in a better position proactively to design institutions, to manage them in a way that could produce great results. And, uh, as with uh, Carolyn's paper, if the, result, if the positive results are few and far between, it's a little harder to have a, basically have a small end to work with, so it's hard to figure out what it would take to produce the success. Bell has a, a larger uh, set of, of um, the data to, to work with, but and I, and what I particularly liked about this paper is that it, it, it did adopt much more so than the other papers, and as a, as a potential editor of a that would see the book through to, to publication. I would like to see uh, more use of theory and analytic frameworks that is typified in this paper. What, it, what Bell draws from the work on policy change is uh, that uh, a number of factors that do make a difference, and, but also just the proposition, the way he put it, that we do sometimes get dramatic change. One thinks of the environmental policies in the 1970s, as much as it would be difficult today in the United States to pass an Endangered Species Act or a Clean Air Act or a Clean Water Act or any number of others from the mid-1970s. It did happen, and most of the major U.S. policies were all enacted in a six-year period from 1970 to 1976. Uh, so it's a reminder, as much as we talk about how conservative political institutions are and how policies develop incrementally and how it's almost impossible to get big change, the reality is that's not correct. We do get big changes, and so for those looking ahead to the to the Great Lakes and other transboundary issues and saying and a number of times we've talked about climate change and we've talked about other uh, issues that are going to be emerging in and water scarcity related to climate change. This is a time where we need big ideas and we need big policy change. So I thought it was uh, very striking in the paper to be able to identify uh, how that process takes place. Another element I'd underscore, and Bill did in his presentation, is the role of ideas. Uh, too often we do talk about institutions and policies and bureaucracies and binding and non-binding agreements and not so much about ideas themselves. And I'm thinking in terms of the spread of ideas about uh, sustainable communities, renewable energy portfolios, uh, carbon trading. Uh, Ecosystem management, very popular during the, the, the 1990s in the United States and the Clinton administration, not so much talked about today. And so ideas, new concepts that start with policy professionals, start with the epistemic communities, percolate on down, go spread across horizontally from state to state, province to province, country to country. Know, knowing more about those processes would certainly uh, help. And I think the Bell's focus on the policy idea here is you don't have to keep the old dams there. There are alternatives. And indeed, if you're concerned about the loss of fisheries, if you're concerned about uh, restoring ecological services, then the idea is a powerful one, which is dams can really be removed. And then you have some successful removals, and those in turn become ideas that motivate others and provide some experience that can be duplicated elsewhere. So the case studies in British Columbia and Ontario uh, do nicely support the uh, the way this change takes place, the subnational level changes, and uh, one particular, going back to the fortuitous alignment of relevant factors, I guess I'd like to see a little bit more about why this is, what those factors are, maybe a table that summarizes how those kind of factors affect in the cases. Um, Bell already touched on a lot in the literature on policy change and interest groups, there's of course quite a bit, and not familiar I think to everybody in this room, about policy issue communities with Kingdom issue networks and with that close work. Um, 
Yeah, no, yeah. So um, Mark's paper, Mark with the Charles uh, Kruger on multi-jurisdictional governance of the Great Lakes. And here again, what I found fascinating about this, and it's a, it's a theme that, we've, that was highlighted yesterday a bit and will come up in the other papers, is uh, binding versus non-binding. Um, cooperative or collaborative management versus having something forced uh, on you. And I thought the, the strength of the paper was to make a very persuasive case that it is possible to have non-binding agreements that actually uh, are um, acceptable uh, to the parties that, that be. They provide the kind of a jurisdictional autonomy, flexible policy that people are seeking. I thought it was refreshing to see an argument that such cooperation and collaboration could work. A good part of the paper, uh, not summarized so much here, deals with, again, the history and the and how this has all played out. The paper nicely reviews the advantages and disadvantages of binding versus non-binding agreement in terms of compliance, transaction, cost, flexibility, and so on. That's a real strength of it. Um, what I would like to say a little bit more on, the, the, uh, the 62 semi-structured interviews, I guess uh, sometimes semi-structured interviews involve some questions that are duplicated across all, and maybe if that was the case, that some tables or reports, the paper makes use of some very interesting quotations from the interviews, but it's not clear how that breaks down in terms of percentage of respondents who felt one way versus another way. Um, the, the, but but the, the results of the interview seem to support a compelling case for a flexible and non-binding plan. Ultimately then, the test as to whether that's sufficient, I guess, would be once again in the outcomes. I, is this gonna hold up over time? Sometimes th these very flexible collaborative arrangements look good early on and the question is can they be sustained over time? Maybe it takes the right kind of political leadership to do so. Um, so if we get a sustainable fishery, if the uh, the fishery resources are maintained sufficiently long, then it would be a very strong case that these kind of non-binding agreements really do produce the results that you need. Uh, finally, I, th I think this a paper that could use maybe a, a little more uh, pertinent theory, and there is some, I mean, uh, common pool resource theory, uh, Della Schlager's chapter in a book that's pertinent to a lot of these proceedings, uh, Durant Fiorino O'Leary's edited volume, Environmental Governance Reconsidered, work of Eleanor Ostrom and, and others would be useful here. And I guess with that, let me turn it over to the audience to see what kind of questions. Thank you, Michael. We have uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, for, for questions. We'll open things to the floor. Thank um, you. Well, could, could you, uh, some of us know others in the room, but perhaps every questioner could uh, uh, introduce himself or herself first. Thank you. Gail Kranzberg, McMaster University. This goes to almost all, all three of our speakers, and in fact, any of the other scholars in the room who want to try it. But I'm going to start with sort of an interface between uh, Carolyn and Mark, which was the whole notion of community development of shared ideas, shared objectives, the strategic plan, for example. In RAP communities where the RAPs are successful, it's because they have a shared vision. They develop it themselves, and then they have the same thing that Mark mentioned that the Fishery Commission has. Everyone's agreed to the plans, and when they go back to their jurisdiction, they've got to find the way to implement what they've agreed to. Um, so what I'm trying to think about is this in the context of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement renewal and the role of um, of an overarching coordinating body. So you have all of the, you have each one of your lake committees or you have each one of your remedial action plans or you have each one of your epistemic communities working successfully locally, and Mark touched upon this yesterday, but disjointed, re learning independently on how to do what they're doing rather than learning from each other. And then there's the overarching lake-wide issues that don't get addressed because we're working at a local level. So what I'd like to get a sense of is how do you conceive of, and I put this to anybody on the panel, how do you conceive of achieving a process-wise, for example, shared objectives for a renewed Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement where people move away and that it is a soft agreement it's consensus based, but people move away from that with a responsibility to go back to their subnational unit and ensure implementation proceeds. And is there a role for an overarching body to help with something like this? Start or shall I? Uh, to answer the, the last part of that first, the, um, the role of an overarching body in Great Lakes fishery management is a theme that has uh, come up over and over again since the late 1800s. 
um, because back then uh, when the jurisdictions were not cooperating, there were attempts to create a super jurisdiction or a commission or some sort of overarching body that would either compel them to cooperate or actually set the regulations uh, themselves. That, was, that occurred in two separate treaties, one in 1908, there was an attempted treaty, and one in 1946, and both times the treaties failed because um, the states, and, and in one case primarily the state of Ohio was the last to object, basically did not want to cede that authority to an overarching body. What's different today with the late committee process and the joint strategic plan is that the overarching body that does facilitate it was a, um, uh, does not have the same sort of authority that would usurp that non-federal authority uh, as a fishery commission, but B, uh, the, uh, the non-federal governments came to the fishery commission <coughs> voluntarily and said, will you help us facilitate that? We don't want you to tell us what to do, but we want somebody, some entity to make sure that we um, meet stick to our agreement, develop objectives, and maybe publish, if you could be so kind as to publish them, keep the minutes, and so on. The role of that body then is really to, um, to make sure that everybody continues to do what they've said they're going to do. Um, it's uh, what I call gentle coercion or peer pressure, or some sort of, of way in which these groups can be um, um, gently coerced into being reminded that it's their plan. It's not the Fishery Commission's plan, it's their plan. And if they don't uh, adhere to it, they're basically ignoring themselves. And uh, it's going to be a lot harder to go back to your home jurisdiction and argue the policy internally and also argue it with your stakeholders. Because what it ultimately does is it provides that sort of cover or defensibility for the policies because everybody's agreed to it. Um, how that relates, say, to the water quality agreement, uh, if I can make an observation, and I think this has also been raised in some of the documents that the, that the IJC has produced, um, one of the strengths that I see, I'll do a strength and a weakness of the, of the non-binding joint strategic plan process. A strength is that it's a strategic plan, not a, fish, not a specific plan that says that, it's the, that you're going to do X, Y, and Z. It's a plan that says we as the entities pledge to work together to identify share, shared objectives and then to, to implement that. Um, it means that uh, the, the plan of 1981, which was the year it was um, implemented, or first implemented, and the plan of today and what they're doing under it is, has changed over time. Um, and it allows them to do that. I think that's a strength. Um, a weakness of, of that type of approach, however, is that the, um, uh, what you're ultimately going to get out of it are a, a cer cer certain policy areas you'll be able to avoid, devote attention to and certain policy areas you won't. For example, in fisheries, um, you're going to be able to devote a lot of attention to <coughs> what are the species composition of the lake, how many of them do you want, um, and how are you going to rehabilitate the species. What you're not going to be able to do really is, um, is hold anyone's feet to the fire on specific regulations, if, especially if they don't want to do that. So, um, you know, if they say, well, you know, we need a walleye quota of X, and they don't use the process to develop that quota, it's open to interpretation whether the folks are truly implementing what they've agreed to under the plan. It's just a it's just a reality is there's certain types of things that you're going to be able to address under that type of agreement. Um, so I think that that can also be applied to the water quality agreement on what you want the objectives to be and how strategic you want it to be. I'll turn it over to you. Sir. Um, well, I guess one of the, th uh, given the, the proliferation of, of institutions, I guess I'm just a little hesitant to kind of go down that path of creating another, um, you know, integrating umbrella force. Um, because I think it's easier for governments to create institutions than change them and um, change their behavior. So, um, I mean, a lot of that is talked about in the IGC documentation about, you know, merging some or creating a Great Lake, maybe using this as a model to create a Great Lakes Water Quality Commission. And the IGC itself performs that function in, in some regards. But my, my paper, I guess, basically says that um, we need to focus more on actual implementation. In other words, most of the RAPs actually in the stage one process did quite well identifying what the problems are and developing the actual plan to do something about it. But my question focuses more on why is the doing not being done, I guess. <laughs> so and like I said, I, I don't know I don't know that more institutions are the answer really. Also at the back, 
Uh, my name is George Cooper. I'm with the Council of Great Lakes Industries. And my, my question for the panel, which I found very interesting, I look forward to reading the papers, is really a, a, a counter to Gail's question that you've just responded to. Uh, uh, and that has to do with the fact that the, from, from our perspective, there's a difference between objectives, a policy that's focused on establishing objectives for collective behavior or action, and the, process, the, the other kind of policy, which is the kind of policy that influences the process by which we achieve those objectives. And I, somehow or another, that differentiation is very important to us because we end up, uh, as industry, being one of the players who uh, pays for the achievement of those objectives. Um, and when you look at the process side, I, and I wonder whether or not you're, you're considering doing that, um, there are some really interesting examples, uh, Bill Lowry, between the U.S., you know, the, the infection of U.S. policy by the Canadians. For instance, the, uh, the policy on toxics, when Canadians started with a wonderful program called ARET, which failed at the last minute because one of the uh, multi-stakeholders backed away early, and but the Canadians didn't give up. They pushed it into the international sphere underneath the, uh, something called the binational toxic strategy, mm -hmm. um, which um, then infected U.S. national toxics strategy, which then became the blueprint for the Stockholm POPs protocol. It's a pretty interesting uh, series of infections, if you will, and 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 I wonder whether or not uh, that might become part of uh, your your uh, focus as you evolve the paper. <coughs> yeah, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that ideas are only flowing <laughs> one way north of the border. I mean, I, I, and I appreciate the suggestion of an example of ideas coming back the other way. Uh, <coughs> and I guess, uh, you know, I, to tie it back to the previous question, I, you know, what I was thinking about in terms of an overarching body, it, it, you know, what seems to me would be useful is not necessarily an overarching body that was trying to pursue regulatory options, but rather some kind of clearinghouse for ideas that, that are developed in different places and can be. And I, I have no idea what that kind of institution would look like, but I think it, would, it could provide a real service. An important thing to uh, keep in mind about the joint strategic plan process is that it's a, um, it's a process for the fishery managers to talk to each other as opposed to uh, being a mechanism for public input. They still have to go back to their jurisdictions and consult their publics consistent often with their own state laws. Michigan has a pretty um, um, clear uh, process that the lake managers have to go through, for instance, in public consultation. That said, the process is set up so that the managers that come to the lake committee process will have already benefited from talking it over with their constituents so that they'll have a good idea of whether what they talk about collectively um, will fly back home. Um, but that's it's also one of the criticisms, actually, of the lake committee process in that the, uh, the, the, the avenues for public involvement in that particular process is not particularly high uh, because, again, they have their own internal processes that they must go through. And in fact, um, as we speak, uh, the judges are considering a case in Ontario that was brought forward by the commercial fishing industry about the Lake Erie Committee process and whether um, it was um, uh, transparent enough um, in, in, the, um, in the ultimate use of the information and the establishment of shared walleye quotas on Lake Erie. So it would be interesting to see how that comes out. Uh, just one last comment. I, I think this is a, a really interesting area of, of the technical, the, at, the, at the technical level there is, seems to be a lot of exchange and ongoing relationships that, that are informal and somewhat more formal in certain contexts. But in terms of sharing of ideas, it's, it's interesting to look at actually how different the ideas in water policy are in um, and I, I've spent about 10 years looking at non-point source water pollution, which was a really important idea in the U.S. policy <laughs> scene, which was nowhere on the map in Ontario until Walkerton. And again, even, uh, as I mentioned earlier, even um, uh, Milwaukee didn't seem to, I'm sure, I don't know how much Walkerton registered even here, but M Milwaukee uh, didn't seem to jibe any kind of policy change or response in terms of an ideas. Is that? I think first uh, at the back, and then I saw Commissioner Olson's hand. I'm Sheila Tews. I'm the Environment and Fisheries Officer at the Canadian Embassy, and I really have enjoyed everyone's uh, papers. Thank you so much. Um, Carolyn, I, I think maybe as I was going out of the room, uh, Michael was referring to perhaps an interest in seeing a little more of a results or, or bottom line. I, I think you didn't have time for that, but um, I wanted just to point out that that, that would be an interesting uh, further exploration because Unless I'm incorrect, uh, cleaning up the areas of concern, for example, 
that Canada was the first to clean up an area of concern in the Great Lakes. I think if you look at the AOCs and where we stand or with all of the other areas, in fact, we may be ahead of the US. Um, this is not a us versus them thing. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, and I'm getting to a point here um, that there, there are elements such as political will, and there's also the point of view that there are other ways to skin a cat to actually achieve objectives. And this was, uh, this was never more clear to me than working in the 80s on acid rain when Canada's somewhat strident concerns to the US was met with a lot of resistance in the US um, about our weaker laws, our lesser federal strengths compared with the US. And uh, so much so that the Environmental Law Institute did a uh, huge study on the two systems. I think it, uh, Greg Whetstone was the author. Um, and it was um, the bottom line, basically, was that in spite of the differences, partly because of political will and other considerations, that Canada was in fact ahead of the United States in dealing with acid rain. So I think that there is that, there's an important element to consider. We have two very different systems. Um, it is possible to be effective or not uh, with both of them. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I would defer. Uh, the reason I don't go into a lot of that is because other academics actually have looked at successes and failures in the individual rats, comparing the various factors and conditions. I, I'll let Mark speak because he's done the most intensive analysis of the RAPs um, in terms of why maybe those two were particularly successful, were they um, easier to remediate, um, were there less players? He's looked at all these different variables. So maybe I'll, I'll let you comment, Mark, on that. Didn't think I'd be on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you've, yeah, it's the focus of more well, of your work than mine. The general conclusion is there's a variety in, in outcome from one uh, AOC to general, another. Yeah which is predictable, and one of the predictabilities, one of the factors underlying that was, um, first of all, how well did they organize the planning, you know, who was included and who was left out, and, and then how did they organize the implementation um, when it was organized uh, amongst a, a great deal of authorities, the ones who worked best were those that had formalized protocols as to who was going to do what and who was mm -hmm. going to report back. So it looked sort of messy and informal, but there was a protocol about who was doing what and a reporting and arrangement. And then you could go to the other extreme where it was delegated to a, a state authority that would essentially be in charge of implementation. So there's a variety of different processes. And I think what, what I get the impression that what has uh, been a major obstacle in the last 10 years has simply been uh, the resources made available by states and the provinces, uh, well, province in Ontario, to the RAP process. Um, because as they like to, as the, my, some of my public servant friends like to, to call it, we, t we picked all the low-lying apples uh, off the tree, and now we have to deal with the ones at the top, which are more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Canadian context, that meant massive upgrading of sewage treatment plants. It meant uh, removal of contaminated sediments. The U.S. has got a better, uh, um, has got has has applied more resources to that latter one than than in the Canadian circumstance. <coughs> um, but again, there's variation in how they, the, the planning and how they implemented. And um, I think a key variable of why there has been limited success in the last 10 years has been this uh, limited amount of money made available f for the RAP process generally. Thank you. Steve, Mi Commissioner Rules. With uh, reference to the Lowry pa uh, paper, uh, the IJC last year sent alerting letters uh, to the governments regarding the Namakan River in uh, northwestern Ontario and what appears to be a discrete policy by the province to expand hydroelectric uh, hydro generation in response to resistance to nuclear and uh, replace 
coal generation. So that together with, uh, as we've worked with the St. Marion milk issue in Montana and Alberta, it appears that climate change may um, at least persuade folks to build more dams to capture the more rainfall and the melting glaciers. So I, I'd suggest your paper should, <laughs> should at least consider the, what appears to be rather dramatic uh, um, yeah. uh, uh, interest in, in more dam building, not less. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Uh, in fact, I, yeah. in, fact I don't, in the paper I do mention that there are plenty of places where they're still pursuing more dams and more hydro than they had been before. I just didn't get into it in the talk, but you're, you're exactly right. And, and in fact, uh, talking to people in Manitoba, their line was, um, it's not that we're we're still building dams, we're just trying to do it right now. That was their line, which I see as a, <laughs> you, you know, you can argue with that or not, but at least it's, a, it's a, a sense of awareness that there are questions and criticisms that have come up about dams and hydro projects that maybe weren't before. It's a fair point. I, th I think we can perhaps squeeze in two more questions if they're relatively short. Okay, I'm, I'm Terry Rolf. I'm a scientist living in Vancouver and Bill, really enjoyed your presentation. I'm certainly not an advocate for dams, although that's a very good point that I've heard from climate change scientists as well. Uh, but I'm wondering if you thought that maybe there's a minimum scale for effective dam removal. Um, that is without it unintended circumstances, uh, because many of us in science have moved beyond the myth of uh, passively restored equilibrium. I was talking to a fish biologist recently in Victoria, and he was looking at the dabbling of uh, dam removal and saw it as a means for invasive species to move between um, optimized feeding pockets. Mm -hmm. That's his words, not mine. So if we have a mix of controlled and naturalized waterways, truly a dynamic complex system, um, do we have to go at it in a large scale? Yeah. Uh, your question. <coughs> and what, what about the measurement? Uh, do we have to be asking not just how many fish or how many species, but exactly what fish? Yeah, two, uh, two comments in response to that. The first one is that um, uh, I certainly don't mean to come off as an advocate of just getting rid of all the dams. They, uh, they're, and I, I guess I'd fall back on a line that American Rivers, the organization here in town, uses, which is we, we, we try to remove dams that don't make sense. Don't make sense economically or ecologically. Um, the uh, actually three comments. The second and the second comment is that I should have paid attention to my colleague Barry Ray when he was setting this thing up because Barry's been pushing me for years to think about the impact of climate change on more hydropower. And I and uh, so I agree that's a fair point. Um, the third, but getting more directly to your question, there are certainly huge issues with dam removal. And whenever they try and do one of these things, they, uh, they have to address certain questions like you said about invasive species, about sedimentation, about what happens to the stuff that's in the bottom of the lake when they take the dam out. And um, the guys in Ontario, one of, the reason that the, one of the reasons that they could remove the Finlayson Dam was because the Finlayson had a natural silt trap so that, that when they took the dam out, the silt wasn't all going to go downstream and screw up whatever the ecosystem was downstream. Unlike they were also looking at the distress dam, but the distress dam did not have such a, fil uh, a system. So that was the physical reason why they couldn't remove the distress. The political one was that there were more property owners on the distress dam, and they didn't want it removed. And the ones in the Finlayson and said, oh, okay. I mean, there were only a couple, and they said, okay, if you have to, you have to. So I do think there are very, very, uh, very serious limits to efforts to remove dams, and there are s really significant questions with what happens when you do it and how you do it. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the case, one of the big cases, and it's real close to the border, one of the big cases in the U.S. now is the Elwha River in Olympic National Park, where the Park Service, well, you know, Don, the Park Service is planning on removing two dams on the Elwha, and they've spent years studying how do we do this? Do we do them simultaneously? Do we do them in sequence? And, and exactly the kind of issues that you're bringing up. So I, I don't suggest that it's a, s a simple process. Before we go to break, uh, two final questions, comments, fairly briefly, please. Right. You, you first, Mark. Okay. Um, the difference between binding and non-binding, I think it might be worth thinking about the two going together often. A lot of non-binding agreements taking place in a framework where there has been some uh, binding arrangement. 
For example, uh, the uh, Canadian Supreme Court uh, found in the early 80s that the can new Canadian Environmental Protection Act trumped the provincial reg uh, acts over pollution regulation. But then it got redefined uh, as being limited to, to the regulation of toxic wastes. And then the federal government, in, his, in a typical manner, may I say, uh, then entered into non-binding agreements with the provinces, basically, and gave away all that jurisdiction again. Um, so that the, the things go together a lot of the times. And a, you, another example would be uh, Aboriginal policy, which the prime actor was the Supreme Court, which developed the concept of Aboriginal rights w um, in the 70s and pushed that. Eventually, it ended up in the Constitution. And now... Uh, federal government is working with, uh, uh, primarily the federal government is working on a series of, inf of informal binding agreements with the, with the uh, various aboriginal bands or tribes. And uh, they would love it to be formalized, but the, they don't know quite what the limits are of the policy. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's a formal requirement, but the informal bits have still got to be worked out. So that I think a lot of times they go together. Does anyone care to comment uh, on the panel? Uh, that's a very good observation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is for uh, Mark, and uh, as I've looked from the perspective of being a natural resources director uh, at the Fishery Commission and looked at who the delegates are uh, coming from organizations within state government that get their money from recreational uh, fishing more than anything else. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the fact that they're dependent upon satisfying the recreational anglers above everything else. Um, biases, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's a bad bias, but biases uh, how they set priorities uh, in terms of, of managing the fishery in terms of, of maximizing species and minimizing species uh, and the like. And uh, do you see any, of course, it, <laughs> you may not want to answer whether you see any problems in that or not, but it's, it's uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's there. Yeah, it, it is certainly there. And, and, and uh, knowing the position that you've held, I'm, you know it as well as anybody. Um, and in uh, the other states, it's also an issue. Uh, there was a very telling article, a book chapter a few years ago in a book about salmon management in the Great Lakes, uh, actually salmon management uh, uh, um, as a subject. It was written by a former DNR director of Michigan and one of his um, colleagues, where they basically acknowledged that uh, years ago the state of Michigan stopped managing uh, the, uh, its fisheries for the commercial fishery and instead shifted to the sport fishery. Um, partially because of the fact that the commercial species were in decline and that there was nothing um, natural species wide that was filling the gap so they could perhaps stock the exotic um, salmon, salmon into the lakes uh, to fill that niche and also to create a recreational fishery. Um, that was one of the most blunt um, admissions, if you will, that I've seen because um, other fishery managers will tell you that, um, that you can do both. Uh, you can manage for the recreational fishery and you can manage for the native fisheries and they don't have to be mutually exclusive because uh, certain fish fill certain niches and and so on but the and, and there is um, indication that there is success in both fronts um, lake trout for example the dominant spe native species in the lakes hit rock bottom because of overfishing and lamprey predation and habitat loss um, and they are working now to restore lake trout it's a generations long effort to do so. In the meantime, there's a lot of stocking of the non-native fish to, um, to fill a niche that would be um, uh, a void rather that would exist if they were just waiting for the native species to be rehabilitated. Um, a lot of that money does come from the um, federal aid and so you do wonder are the fishery programs um, biased in that regard. The other um, reality that we need to remember is that the fishery is valued at about $4 billion um, in some economic reports and the commercial um, side of that is a small fraction of the total $4 billion fishery. 
you're talking about the vast majority of that is, is recreational um, and, and what, um, what that kind of money, uh, re recreational activity brings into it. Um, I wouldn't be the first to suggest that, um, that that is a big driver in a lot of the fishery management decisions. But when you read the fish community objectives, um, I'm continually impressed by the fact that they, the fishery managers from the states, uh, Ohio, Michigan, and, and the tribes uh, in Ontario are trying very hard to rehabilitate the native species and in fact make sure that there's no loss <coughs> of, a, of a species in that. The fish community objectives are full of those kinds of, um, of goals. Very good. Well, we're going to break for coffee now and we'll readjourn at uh, 1045. Thank you. <laughs>